All right. Hello, everyone. I can see there's still folks joining from the, the waiting room, um, but we do want to make sure we go ahead and get started just in case you all have some other things um, coming up on your schedule for today. Uh, so I just wanted to say, first of all, welcome to everyone who's joining us uh, for Dissertation Dish today. I'm Trina Van Skindel, and in my professional role, I'm the Membership Director for Imagining America, Artists and Scholars in Public Life, which is one of the new co-organizers of the Dissertation uh, Dish alongside LEAD California and the International Association for Research on Service Learning and Community Engagement, or IRSLICE. Um, I'm also a current doctoral candidate at Michigan State University in the Higher Adult and Lifelong Education Program. Um, and I've actually also been a part of Iris Slice um, for the last six years. So I'm a prior chair of the Iris Slice Graduate Student Network and an Iris Slice board member, a prior board member. Um, and I continue to serve on the Graduate Student Network Steering Committee. Um, so I'm just really excited to be here in all my capacities today um, and joined by my colleagues. Uh, including our presenter today, Star. Uh, in addition to introducing myself, I also wanted to provide a little bit of background um, to this webinar series, especially for those who may not have been able to attend our first session in April. The dissertation dish, uh, like I mentioned before, is a collaboration uh, between Iris Slice, Imagining America, and LEAD California, formerly Cal California Campus Compact. And the dissertation dish webinars are meant for all audiences, not just graduate students. So everyone from seasoned scholars, to practitioners, to of course graduate students, as well as journal editors or maybe conference organizers who are seeking scholars to prevent the most uh, current and innovative research in the field. So the dis dissertation dish webinars serve to lift up and highlight some of the most recent research that has been done in the community engagement and service learning field and also create a way for journal editors and conference organizers to be exposed to this new research and also good presenters. Um, and we also hope that it offers some support and possible guidance for those who are either in, that are in graduate programs um, by way of tips from those who have just gone through and, and completed their own graduate programs. So in April, we held our inaugural uh, webinar featuring Dr. Melissa Kwan. And Dr. Kwan shared her dissertation on a framework for justice centering relationships and understanding impact in higher education community engagement. You can view her presentation on the LEAD California website and we'll have a link for that in, a chat, in the chat. We had over 120 people register for that last webinar and we're excited that just as many people <laughs> have signed up to participate in today's webinar. So today's webinar will feature the dissertation of Dr. Star Claxton Moore the Director of Community Engaged Learning in the Department of Organization and Leadership at the University of San Francisco. Dr. Plaxton Moore will be discussing her dissertation topic, Engaging Feminism, Transforming Institutions, How Community Engagement Professionals Employ Critical Feminist Praxis to Reimagine and Reshape the Public Purpose of Higher Education. So finally, I'm just going to go over a few logistics. And I'm actually going to turn it over to my co-moderator, Rochelle Smarr, who is Director of Service Learning and Civic Engagement at California State University San Marcos and LEAD California's 2022 Emerging Scholar in Community Engagement Award winner. And she'll kick us off. So those logistics. So what can you expect for the next 90 minutes or so? So for the first 20 to 25 minutes, um, Dr. Plaxton Moore is going to give her presentation. Then after that, we'll have a moderated Q&A question and answer session, um, which Rochelle and I will um, be facilitating. So we'll, that'll last about 30 minutes. And then for those who can um, stay on, we are offering also the opportunity for a more in-depth, informal conversation with Dr. Plaxton Moore. Um, and that'll conclude the final 30 minutes of the webinar today. A few more housekeeping items. We do encourage you to name or maybe rename yourself um, by clicking on the three little lines if you hover or dots if you hover um, on your image in the Zoom window. Um, you can click rename and then you can add your organization, name or rename yourself. You can also share your preferred pronouns. We also recommend that you select speaker mode just because you know there's a good number of folks on the call today and speaker mode will allow you to keep, of course, the speaker front and center. 
We also ask that you keep yourself muted during the presentation today, just so we can hear as much of, of Dr. Black Seymour's presentation as possible. If you do have any questions during the webinar, please post those in the chat. We will be keeping track of your questions um, for the Q&A in the later half uh, of the session. And so during that Q&A, we'll be sure that we review any questions in the chat and uh, make sure that we're uh, bringing those to the surface for, for folks to um, hear and for STAR to address. So lastly, just a reminder that we are recording this webinar today and it will be up and available in about a day or two on Lee California's YouTube channel. And we'll also send out a link once it's available. So with that, I welcome my co-host, uh, Rochelle Smar, to further introduce herself and our dissertation dish speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Trina. I am so excited to be here in this virtual space with everyone. Uh, again, Rochelle Smar. I'm the Director for Service Learning and Civic Engagement here in very hot San Diego um, at Cal State San Marcos. I'm also a doctoral student, so I'm excited that Trina is in, in the mix with me and getting this degree done so we can be our next dissertation dish speakers. Woo we'll be next. Give us a couple of years. Um, but I'm also just very excited to kind of introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Star Plaxton-Moore. Um, I'm just ecstatic that she's gonna share her research with each and every one of you. And so I'm gonna give a brief bio of her and then we're gonna turn it over to Star. So Star is the Director of Community Engaged Learning at the University of San Francisco. Uh, she directs institutional support for community engaged courses. She oversees public service programs for undergraduates, including the public service and community engagement minor at the university. Her scholarship focuses on faculty development for community engaged teaching and scholarship, student preparation for community engagement, assessment for civic learning outcomes, community engagement and institutional culture, she recently co-authored a book with one of our fellow IRSI's board members, uh, David Donahue. So if you don't have it yet, you should get it. I'll put a link for it in Amazon. It's a really handy book that I'm using for my McDonald's scholars this year. Um, she also consults with independent K through eight schools on service learning and community engagement. She was elected to the board of International Association for Research on Service Learning and Community Engagement in 2019. She holds a master's in education from George Washington University and received her educational doctorate in organizational leadership from the University of San Francisco. Um, and so I am delighted to welcome to the virtual stage and just give you guys a really good peek into a big and amazing brain in the field of community engagement, Dr. Star Plaxton Moore. Welcome. Thank you. This is so lovely. Okay. Um, let me share my screen. Hold on. So it's really comforting to be here among so many old friends and new friends. Um, it's definitely helped me feeling, helping me to feel a bit more relaxed about this. So I haven't you know, you, so I finished my dissertation last May and I have, I'm turning part of it into a book chapter. So I did kind of keep my hand in the mix uh, for a little bit, but it kind of feel, it felt like going back to an old friend, um, going back to it to prepare for this presentation. And I'm really honored that I get to share, um, get to share this study with you. It was actually, it was an incredibly joyful process for me. Um, and so hopefully that comes through. So as Trina said, my focus is really on um, how critical feminist principles and theories kind of inform community engagement professionals and how they do community engaged work and how they kind of uh, reimagine the public purpose of higher education. And really, so, so this is the sort of official purpose of the study, but, but really, when I realized, you know, I had to do a dissertation, um, I had been in the field of community engagement for about 15 years. Uh, and I really just felt like, okay, what kind of study can I do where I just get to dig deeply into the practices of the people I admire most in our field, right? The folks who I have befriended, the folks who I admired from afar, the people who were doing really revolutionary work and I thought, how could I construct a, um, a dissertation whereby I really just get to learn from them and try to synthesize all of their wisdom into something that can guide me and others in our practices. And then simultaneously in my doctoral program, 
I was taking courses on critical feminist leadership and really wanted to kind of bring that lens um, into, uh, into the study. So I wanted to look at, you know, the policies and practices, the relationships, um, understanding the role and responsibilities, understanding of the field um, by these community engagement professionals who seemed to employ a critical feminist praxis. So I was also really influenced by, you know, so many of these organizations, Imagining America, Irish Life, Campus Compact, Lead California, have put on incredible webinars and, and programming over the past few years that really bring a critical lens to community engagement and to higher ed. And so I've really been animated by, um, you know, the problem of the public purpose of higher education being constrained by all these forces of neoliberalism and positivism, settler colonialism, um, yet recognizing that higher education and academia has a role to play in achieving transformative justice in our world. Uh, and so community engagement, I think can be one, you know, I think many of us agree probably that community engagement can be one strategy uh, for advancing higher education's public purpose and addressing pervasive justice issues. But the challenge is that it's often um, at many of our institutions kind of gets limited to very superficial or performative um, engagement and, and can perpetuate the status quo. So I was really interested in how community engagement professionals, people in positions like mine and like many of yours, uh, can act as institutional change agents and really be intentional in our praxis in a way that reshapes our institutions and the broader um, sector of higher education and how critical feminist theories and principles might guide that work. So I had six research questions. I'm not gonna read them all to you, but I'll just say, again, I was really interested in uh, looking at how, uh, what critical feminist principles and theories were guiding CEP's work and how they were understanding their relationship between community engagement and higher ed, um, how they were defining their roles and responsibilities, how critical feminism was shaping their practices and policies and their relationships with community partners, and how it was also shaping their vision of what was possible um, for community engagement at their institution, and the extent to which that was integrating community partner perspectives as well, and then what sort of institutional change strategies CEPs employed. So those were my research questions. My methodology, it was, uh, it was qualitative, it was grounded theory. Um, you know, I think many of us know and, and greatly appreciate and honor um, a lot of the scholarship and research done by Dr. Lino Destilio and others around even just defining the responsibilities and competencies for community engagement professionals, but there hadn't been any sort of intentional integration of um, feminist frameworks with the role of CEPs. So in that way, it felt like grounded theory was, was the right fit. Um, I really wanted to integrate and draw on feminist and participatory action research principles to guide my methodology. So it's not a PAR project per se, um, but I really wanted to prioritize narratives and stories. Um, I wanted to account for power dynamics, relationships, uh, the context in which people were doing their work. And I wanted this research to ultimately sort of help push us toward uh, more justice oriented ways of doing community engagement. So I selected seven CEPs to um, be in the study and it was a purposive sample. I chose folks from my own networks or uh, people that were recommended to me by my committee members, my dissertation committee members. And I did 50 minute Zoom interviews with each of them. And then what I am sort of proud of and what was, I, I really enjoyed kind of the second piece of my um, qualitative methodology involved facilitating a co-visioning conversation between each of those CEPs and then a community partner that they selected. Um, and those conversations were really fun and amazing and, and offered up so much insight about the nature of the relationships between uh, the CEPs and their partners. And then with all of that great qualitative data, of course I did 
um, both inductive and deductive coding. So inductive looking at any sort of themes that emerged from the data, um, particularly as they related to feminist um, principles. And then the deductive coding process was really guided by um, Adrienne Marie Brown's Emergent Strategy. I think many of you are probably familiar with this book. Basically, she lays out a strategy for social change with six elements that kind of mirror the um, natural change processes um, in the natural world. And so I used the six elements to um, kind of guide and organize my themes in the deductive piece. I did, of course, engage in member checking, kind of going back to the PAR principles, making sure that every participant was able to see what I was looking at and the themes that were emerging from what they had shared. And then ultimately, I was able to produce a conceptual framework that I'm really excited to, to share with you today. So in terms of my findings, kind of the big meta theme that came up was um, feminism was really seen as an aspirational praxis for the participants in my study. So they didn't claim it as an identity, right? They didn't feel like, oh yeah, I, you know, I'm a feminist, I wear a feminist badge. Um, they all talked about how feminism was sort of this thing that they aspired to enact, right? That they were always really striving toward. Um, and so one of the participants Sloan described critical feminism as a North Star and said she saw it as an aspiration for herself and the person she wanted to be in the world and that it helped her make really practical decisions about the things she wanted to prioritize. Another piece of this, of this uh, meta theme was the definition of critical feminism. So, you know, all of the participants sort of defined it in their own words and in their own way. Um, but some of the commonalities across them was really that um, critical feminism is about addressing systemic injustices, working toward equity, that there is a focus on women, but that it's not exclusively on women, and that it's really about collective liberation. And so Henry gave kind of a great description here. Feminism is a framing or a way of understanding the world that is about equity and liberating all peoples, not just women. It's about the examination of a lot of different dynamics. Feminism is about not just saying we need justice, but we want justice on our terms. And then finally, I was really interested in kind of who were the scholars and activists that were inspiring my study participants' understanding of um, critical feminism and of their work. And so four of the participants referenced uh, beloved bell hooks two referenced Audre Lorde and two referenced Adrienne Marie Brown. And then here I've listed other scholars and activists that my participants named um, in terms of who was motivating their community engaged work. So then I, I'll move into uh, the findings organized by the emergent strategy um, elements. I'll try to define each of the elements and then talk about uh, kind of what that looked like in practice, some of the thematic um, practical applications that came up from the study participants. So the first component of emergent strategy is fractals. Um, in terms of how to define that succinctly, it's really about individual or interpersonal expressions and actions uh, that accumulate in a multiplier effect to create broader institutional and, and systemic change. Um, and so in terms of fractal practices that were done by participants in the study, they talked a lot about the importance of interpersonal relationships and how those are sites of learning and growth, whether it was them learning from others, other faculty, students, staff, and community partners, or them being the ones to share um, wisdom and, and knowledge and information with these other constituencies. In addition, they really saw opportunities to promote particular um, frameworks and ideas and values through program design and implementation, whether that's for students or faculty or community partners. Um, they brought this idea of uh, being able to influence institutional initiatives. So they would bring their values as community engagement professionals and their knowledge into these institutional spaces um, to influence decision-making and then kind of related to that 
committees and boards. So um, one of the participants talked about, you know, I want to make sure that the community engagement sort of mindset and framework is at the table, um, is at as many tables as possible at the university. The second element is intentional adaptation, and that's really about making informed changes while also staying true to a deeper purpose. Uh, so participants in the study talked about their own personal adaptation processes, whether that was um, how they sort of evolved as professionals over time or how they adapted to new institutions, how they adapted in a transition from maybe working on the nonprofit side to working in higher ed. Uh, there was a lot of reflection on, on you know, the power of those processes and kind of how they stayed true to themselves. Um, having to pragmatically adapt programs and initiatives, so you know, in light of budget cuts or shifting priorities at the institutions, how were these uh, study participants able to keep programs going um, and keep them accessible? And then, of course, you know, uh, everybody talked about their role in strategic planning and the importance of kind of big picture, uh, forward thinking planning. And part of that was really about how are we staying relevant? How is community engagement staying relevant to the social change work that's happening, particularly outside of our institutions um, and out in the world around us. The next element from emergent strategy is about interdependence and decentralization, right? So how are we demonstrating accountability to others and shared decision-making? The study participants in their reflections and the anecdotes that they shared uh, we're very clear that their work is done in collaboration with others on their teams. Um, you know, nobody was sort of like claiming uh, that they were doing their work independently or individually. There was very much this desire to share, uh, to share the credit for all the work that they had done. So that was clear in how they talked about their work. Uh, there were times when they were charged with making decisions that were going to affect large numbers of people. And they gave stories about how they made sure to do that collaboratively and inclusively. So there was, there was this approach to collaborative decision-making versus more expedient individualized um, sort of power-based decision-making. They really saw part of their role as supporting others, whether that was supporting students, supporting colleagues or uh, staff members, um, you know, it wasn't just about doing programs, but there was really this piece around mentorship and support for other people in the field and in the institution. And then building interpersonal relationships. So uh, it's not just about institutional partnerships or transactional uh, exchanges in community engagement, but the interpersonal connections were very important to the folks in my study. And then when we had those great conversations between the community engagement professionals and the community partners, uh, it was really beautiful to see kind of this display of candor and humor, uh, this comfort with being able to critique uh, community engagement more broadly and the practices of the institutions and really coming from that place of trust with each other. So that was really evident. Um, and then the next component or the next element in emergent strategy is nonlinear and iterative change. So that's really about how do we move through a cycle of maybe making mistakes, learning from those mistakes, and then trying again in new ways. Um, in terms of study participants, they shared stories of, of how they had learned from past experiences or mistakes that they had made individually in their professional lives. Uh, they talked about recognizing and challenging their own biases and, and you know, making sure to, to minimize or eliminate how those were um, shaping their work. They also talked a lot about kind of their evolving understandings of community engagement and beginning to sort of question uh, and critique some of the original practices or um, understandings of community engagement that they maybe began with when they started in the field, but changed as they um, you know, accumulated more experience. And then critiquing and addressing institutional mistakes. So there was a lot of uh, conversations about things that, you know, decisions or actions that were taken at the institutional level that maybe have harmful consequences and the need for repair um, for those things. 
And then the, the fifth element of emergent strategy is about transformative justice, which is really changing the root causes of injustice um, to achieve greater, greater equity. Uh, in terms of what participants in the study shared, they, they gave lots of examples of ways that they were able to enact small scale experiments in justice, right? So maybe you know, the whole institution wasn't able to act uh, justly in a particular way, but how could they within their purviews, within kind of their locus of power, uh, be able to make sure that justice was centered in their student programming or in their faculty uh, fellows program. And then they also uh, really focused on cultivating and co-developing a transformative vision for their institution, the community and the world, right? So these community engagement professionals who were in the study, they weren't just kind of going through the motions, doing the work, being reactive to what the institution needed and wanted. They were really being driven by um, aspirations for what community engagement could do um, in terms of transformation and, and justice. And then the final element for emergent strategy is creating more possibilities, which is really focusing on um, abundance and diversity and the importance of those things in how we understand the work. And participants in the study really talked about, you know, they saw their role as shaping institutional culture, not just overseeing a public service center or overseeing programming. They talked about uh, feeling a sense of responsibility to contribute to and shape the broader field of engagement, participating in scholarship and, and um, professional associations and things like that. Um, allocating resources to build capacity. So to the extent that they had power over um, and decision-making uh, authority over resources, like they would think about how do they try to maximize the benefits, particularly to those who might otherwise not have access to those resources or programs, um, which kind of goes to the facilitating access piece. And then also looking for ways to collaborate with others within the institution and outside of the institution to create more opportunities for people to be involved in community. And then there were uh, four inductive themes that came out. So the first was intersectional power analysis. There's a quote here from Kimberly Crenshaw that uh, kind of attempts to briefly define what that is. Uh, but participants in the study gave a lot of examples and reflections on thinking about their own identity and positionality, how students experience identity and power, um, how power dynamics play out within their institution, within our field and in higher ed more broadly. And then also thinking about power dynamics between campus and community. The next inductive theme was really, a, was about disrupting the status quo. And um, the folks in my study were finding ways to try to disrupt the way things had always gone and, and to try to create um, new possibilities. So that might be as simple as enacting gentle disruptions, like asking critical questions in a meeting or decision-making process, or naming power dynamics and biases and assumptions that might otherwise be implicit um, in a conversation. Also bigger things like resisting uncompensated additional labor, particularly for the folks um, who identified as, as people of color and women in my study, uh, you know, that was a really powerful form of resistance and disruption for them. And uh, people had some great stories about that. And then departing from how things have always been done. So not being afraid to try something new um, to make things more innovative and accessible, and then infiltrating spaces that were otherwise meant to ex exclude particular people or groups. Uh, another inductive theme was mentorship and kind of the importance of um, not just academic colleagues as mentors, but participants in the study also talked about how they had been inspired and influenced by family and friends from the time we were young children. Um, and also by community wisdom holders, people that they worked alongside um, through their community engagement or, you know, in prior professional um, roles. And that, that that was a really powerful site and relationship of learning. And then finally, reverence for community wisdom. Uh, and so participants really articulated valuing community partners as co-educators 
uh, of students and of themselves and faculty. They recognized that it was important for community partners to play a role in institutional decision making and kind of looked for opportunities to uh, promote and facilitate that. And then also really saw community partners as co-visionaries and figuring out what community engagement at their institutions should look like and, and what the impact should be. So those were the um, inductive themes. And then ultimately what came out of my um, data analysis process was this conceptual framework. Uh, the original was a very primitive sketch <laughs> that I did. And then I found an amazing graphic design student, Natalie Ferrer, who, who made it into what you see here. Um, just in terms of kind of giving you a tour of the framework, which is called the Ecosystem of Critical Feminist Praxis for Community Engagement Professionals. Um, we can start at the bottom, which is, is sort of the, um, the fertile grounds, as I call it, or the foundations of the CEP's work. In the case of my study participants, it was clear that the foundations for their work uh, were rooted in an understanding of critical theory, um, vast knowledge of scholarship on engagement, uh, a desire to really draw on activist traditions that they had been part of or had studied, uh, and then they were also clearly drawing on their own lived experience to inform their work and were really looking to mentors um, to guide them as well. So those were the, um, the fertile grounds. And then kind of the next part of the tour is sort of looking, uh, looking at what's in the air, which is symbolized by the clouds. And this is really the context in which community engagement professionals are doing their work. So you can see they're in this context of the higher education sector of the particular community where they're situated, um, of our broader society and the particular historical moment they're working within, um, within the community engagement field. And so how are all of those things uh, really facilitating or constraining their capacities to do their work? More specifically, you can see um, that the sun represents the college or university. And, and I kind of think about it as the source of light and heat. Right, so it has significant influence on the community engagement professional in terms of uh, the culture of the organization and the resources that it brings to bear. Uh, but our institutions also have resources and power that can be brought to bear for a public purpose. So how do we sort of direct that light, direct that heat in positive ways? Um, next is really the um, kind of the, the body in the center and the embodied praxis, which is an integration of values, thought processes and actions. It was really clear from my interviews that there was sort of a constant process of power analysis and self-reflection that was being done by these community engagement professionals and that they were driven by um, some common values that came up among them, which were equity, love and justice. Um, and then that their actions really fell into these categories of disruption and creation. And so, you know, there were things that they did that were about disrupting the status quo, dismantling um, systems of power, privilege, and oppression where they could within their purviews, and then creating these new possibilities, creating relationships, creating um, opportunities. And then if you look up kind of in the hair, the, it's what I call the tendrils of change. Um, these practices that community engagement professionals use to, to be able to try to make change in their institutions and in the field. Um, these range from student programs and faculty development to producing scholarship, doing strategic planning, being in partnership with community. And then finally, kind of in the center is this bloom of possibility, which is, the aspirations for our community engaged work. And participants in this study um, really summed up their aspirations as a desire to foster holistic student development, uh, to co-construct knowledge with uh, multiple wisdom holders, to build authentic relationships as an end in themselves, not just as a means of doing the work, um, making sure that there's accountability to the broader communities, however those are defined, and then ultimately um, having their work be part of a movement for transformative justice. So that's the framework. 
Um, really quickly, just some of the limitations and recommendations. It was a qualitative study, as you know, that can't be generalized, but hopefully lessons can be taken from what I've shared. It was a small sample size. I wish I could have interviewed like 100 people in our field, including probably everyone in this in this Zoom room to learn more. Um, but I only had I only interviewed seven people. Uh, there are diverse understandings of what it means to be a critical feminist. So I think trying to really like pinpoint that I did my best in the process. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a fluid construct. And then, of course, the study is shaped by my own positionality and worldview and, and um, identity. In terms of recommendations, what came out of this study for me is that we need to focus on the fertile grounds, focus on the foundations of our work. How are we making sure as we bring new professionals into our field that we're really um, helping them think about the activist traditions, finding the mentorship they need, uh, you know, engaging with critical theory, all of these different foundations that really give a rich understanding of the work of community engagement. Um, how might my, my conceptual framework be used in professional development programs to just as a, as a tool for self-reflection? Um, how do we create more co-visioning opportunities for CEPs and community partners? So when I think about, you know, what are some studies I wanna do in the future? It's more of those facilitated observed conversations between CEPs and their community partners. It was really fascinating. Um, and I learned so much from that. And then further research in, on intersections of critical feminism and community engagement. And then finally, thinking more about mentoring models for CEPs, particularly connecting CEPs to mentors who are you know, in community, um, community wisdom holders outside of academia. All right, so I will stop there. All right, thank you. Let's give a round of applause, virtual, or unmute yourselves. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Star. And, and I just want to bring up a few, you know, beautiful comments from the chat. Literally beautiful visuals, so memorable from Melissa. Um, Michelle saying, yes, I agree with Melissa's comments above. Lori saying, yes, love the tendrils of change. I think that the visual that you shared seems to have really resonated with people. Um, and then Sylvia shared the idea of, I love disrupt and create as two brackets around the value centered heart that really resonates with my daily reality as a community engagement leader and have not, and I have not seen it so clearly described before. So yeah, I just, yeah, I wanted to make sure you heard those or saw those. <laughs> as you are, I know, are giving your presentation. And, um, you know, for me too, I would just say, reflecting on, on your presentation today, I, it really is inspiring, but I think challenging, right? Challenging us to really think or rethink um, how we view ourselves um, as community engagement professionals. Um, for those of us who hold that identity, and just personally as a doctoral student, I was really inspired to see how creative and interesting <laughs> we can make some of the results that we have, right? Um, so that was also, I, I found that to be really inspiring. So um, yeah, I just wanted to share a few thoughts and also Rochelle invite you to share some of your thoughts um, as well. Yeah, no, Trina, I think you're exactly right. I think I've definitely challenged, but also resonated with me a lot from Star's presentation. And truly, I see it as a call to action is that as CEPs, we have to do more. We have to be a little more intentional about our partnerships, and not just for placing students, but how we're being co-educators and co-visioners with our community partners. And I'm just just amazed at like this presentation and like, oh, I haven't thought about like the fact that our community partners are just as vital to this because they hold wisdom. And so this and learning more about the emergent um, strategy book, I'm like, wow, we need, really need to reconsider our power dynamics and how we're approaching our partners, but also how are we training ourselves? Um, and that might be one of my, my initial questions for you, Star, is like, how do we train um, community engaged professionals to have that kind of uh, honorary um, reverence when it comes to working with community partners, maybe? That might, be, might not be the right word, but how do we get them in the mindset that it's not just so transactional, but it has to be transformational from the beginning. Um, and then we can probably get into some questions too, but what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I have to say, when I think about, you know, who really inspired me to transform my understanding of relationships with community partners, 
Um, it's our dear friends and colleagues at University of San Diego and just getting to, they're so generous and kind of inviting folks to be part of their relationships with community partners, whether that's in San Diego or New Orleans. And, um, you know, they're focused on breaking bread together and they're focused on celebrating together and just being in conversation and being able to kind of come along and witness that um, it totally transformed how I was interacting with community partners, which was very, you know, like it's, I think it's easy to get into that very transactional place of like, okay, what do you need from us? What would be helpful? Okay, well, here's what we have, you know, versus like really focusing on, let me come to you. Let's go to a cafe in your neighborhood. Let's talk about, you know, what brought us to this work. And, um, you know, so, so I think to the extent that we can demonstrate that as, as just mentors and models for people coming into the field um, and then pointing to other exemplars of that, I think is super helpful. And obviously, you know, community partners, what I love about so many of the folks we work with in, in community is that they will just tell you plainly, like, I'm not gonna partner with you until I know your story and you know mine. Um, and so, you know, having, having people get to engage directly with partners will be a great learning experience too. Thank you. Um, I think you're right. You're absolutely right. And I forget that down the street is UC San Diego and USC. They're doing some really good work. <laughs> um, but Michelle has a question for us or for you in the chat. Um, and I think she's asking if you can provide a quick summary about your participants in your study. Um, what were your, what was your criteria? How long were they in the field? And maybe any commonalities that you can draw from the demographics. Yeah, it's so funny. Melissa, this was like, <laughs> this was like the question I feared because it's like, oh, it's been a few years. So I'm just going back and looking through. Um, I did have criteria and um, yeah, it's in my appendix B the eligibility. So it was someone who, you know, you had to work full time as a community engagement professional, hold a leadership position of assistant director or above. Um, your role is defined as staff or administrator, not faculty, been in the field for at least five years, explicitly espouse or implicitly embody critical feminist principles, including, and then I have eight here that I described. So I would reach out to potential participants with that, you know, these sort of criteria and say, if this fits who you are and you want to participate, then, um, then let me know. So that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> That's fine. It was, I was like, oh, it's in the, it's in the appendix, so I can find it easily. So Star, as a, as a current graduate student, I was wondering um, if there was anything that surprised you in your research, you know, whether it was thinking about your process or your findings, maybe some of the implications you found, um, what was surprising to you? Yeah, well, I think one thing I didn't pay attention to that came like early on that came up in the data was around mentoring and mentorship and how important that was to people. Um, and it's funny because I was just sharing how I think that's how we learn how to be in and with community is to be mentored by others who do that well. But um, I didn't really dig into it in my lit review. I didn't really like think about it or talk about it in the early parts of my dissertation, but it clearly came up a lot in the interviews as, as being a really power, powerful formative experience. Um, and then I think the other thing that actually surprised me was just how much I enjoyed the research process. I mean, I tried to design it that way. Like I said, it was like, I wanted to talk with people I admired and I got to do that. Um, but I really enjoyed the process in a way that I wasn't expecting. Alrighty, Sar. So we have one more question from uh, Laura Shelton. Can you talk about how PAR influenced your research design? Yeah. Um, so as I said, it, it wasn't a PAR study, but I was trying to draw on, on PAR principles, right? Which is really about like, how do we center people's stories? How do we recognize um, wisdom and information being shared in relationships and, and through conversation. How do we try to empower participants as much as possible? 
Um, and so, so there was the process whereby, you know, initially folks, I reached out to people to be participants and obviously they, they were able to opt in. And then um, I interviewed them, I would share back the transcripts, they would have a chance to provide feedback um, or any clarifications. Then when I did the community partner and CEP conversations, I similarly reflected back, okay, here's the transcript and here's some of the themes I observed. You know, so there were lots of opportunities where I invited folks to kind of check my thinking um, and, and have a role in it. And then um, I, you know, I did make sure to share back once the dissertation was final, I did share it back with all the participants. Um, I did invite them to my dissertation. So I really, I wanted them to feel like they weren't just research subjects, uh, but like that they were an integral part of it. They really were. And I think one of the things I struggled with actually was having to keep participants anonymous because the wisdom that they shared was so powerful. And, and I just want to like honor that by naming that, right? By saying like this person shared this really powerful insight. Um, and so um, I don't, that doesn't necessarily relate to PAR, but just to give you a sense of like, it was something I really struggled with to make it anonymous um, and then feel like um, I wanted those folks to be honored uh, very specifically for contributing what they contributed. Thanks, Star. And I think kind of relating to this question, um, Lori wondered, um, they said, I noticed that these ways of being or doing that are centered in your research stand in contrast to dominant ways of knowing being that we encounter in higher ed. So did you gather ideas for how we might shift this to being more of the norm? So as part of, of your research or process? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I mean, one of the other sort of premises for me in, in designing this um, study was like the people that some of the people I admire most in our field are not publishing, are not presenting at webinars. Like they're so busy doing the work, you know, kind of the, the, the deep work in and with community, with our students. And so, um, you know, how could I be maybe a conduit for collecting that wisdom and, and, and helping it reach a broader audience? Um, and so I don't know, I don't know if there's implications for that, right? Like how do we get more of the people who are like so deeply in the work and not necessarily thinking about publishing or presenting, um, how can we facilitate uh, more learning from them? And, and I, I don't know, I think conversations are a great way to do it. I think, you know, getting to be it, like interview folks, like it doesn't, it doesn't even have to be for a research project, right? But what if we all took time over the summer to just reach out and connect with like five to seven colleagues that we admire and just have a conversation with them um, and learn from their practice. I think it'd be a really valuable way to, to build our field. I agree, Star. And I feel like, you know, when we have these opportunities to go to a Kumu or RSI or maybe a Lee California like conference, maybe this is where we ask our community partners to come with us. Um, you're so deep and invested in like the work of the field. Why not come and present and we can share? And maybe that's another way for them to share out their wisdom in a non-traditional way because scholarship, it doesn't have to be public publicizing. So I, I, I agree, like there's so many ways we can invite them to the conversation and just elevate their wisdom for more people to hear from them. So wonderful. Um, we have a question from Marissa. Is there something that you're doing differently as a result of your research? Yeah, um, doing different. So, so absolutely, I would say uh, more directly trying to draw on um, the foundations that I've learned and trying to expand the foundations for my practice. And I'm really fortunate to be involved in some professional groups like our epistemic justice group where I've, I've gotten to um, engage with more critical scholarship and really allow that to shape my thinking um, and, and my practice around community engagement. Um, I think Again, like the community partners, actually one of the things I did coming out of that research process was then at my own institution, put together a series of three conversations around transforming the vision of community engagement in light of um, you know, the pandemic, in light of 
racial justice uprisings. And so bringing together faculty and community partners and being able to facilitate that conversation to produce a vision of like, what could this look like for USF? Um, and, you know, so it, it has had implications for my, for my practice for sure in those ways. I've also, I actually adapted my um, conceptual framework and I've facilitated it in a few classes um, with students where it's really helping them kind of identify, okay, like what's an issue that they care about or that they're involved in and then kind of walking them through like, okay, what are the foundations or uh, understandings that they're drawing on? Uh, what's the context that they're working within? what values are driving them. So I, I've had some fun kind of turning it into a way to facilitate student reflection too. And uh, I'm sure, I know you mentioned that you're you're working on a book chapter that's related to this. So maybe someday you'll also work on sharing some of those ad adapted materials that you've used in your classes out with folks as well. I'm sure people would be interested in, in seeing those. So thank you for, for sharing about that. Um, in a little bit different direction, we did have um, Michelle who has noted in their experience a trend um, with more female students engaging in community-based learning, um, at, or at least at higher rates um, than male-identified students. So they're curious if there is maybe some sort of relationship between this and, and, and what you have done in your own research. In other words, they said, um, do you think critical feminist praxis uh, is integrated into our work in a manner that leads community-based learning to resonate more for women than for men. And so I don't know if that's something that you've thought about as well. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, there must be, I mean, there must be something, right? I, I think about, I feel like I, I don't have a lot of sort of deep understanding about, you know, some of those theories around uh, gender identity development and kind of what leads maybe women to be more attracted to service um, and community service and service learning and volunteering. Um, but I, uh, there was definitely something and, and not everyone I interviewed identified as a woman, um, but there is definitely something there about uh, prioritizing relationships, being in community and working alongside others uh, things that um, I think resist the dominant ways of, of understanding work, right? Which is like more competitive, more individual. How do we, um, you know, sort of do the work to get individual accolades or uh, build our own power? Um, and so I think like the nature of community engagement really um, resists a lot of those things. And so maybe it attracts you know, people who who reject that way of, of working or moving through the world. And maybe that's gendered in some ways. This is something maybe during the conversation if other people have enlightened things to say, we can circle back on that question. I'd love to hear other people's thoughts about it. Yes, thank you, Star. I think it would be great to open that up to the rest of the, of the group. But before we go, because we have about five minutes before we get, get into that deep dive, do you have any advice for current grad students that are doing research on community engagement? Yeah. Um, well, so I remember hearing from doctoral students, like, Here, here's how you do the dissertation process. And I think all of them were like, I would write for two hours a day. Um, and I remember thinking like, I can't get anything done in two hours. Like I can't do any deep intellectual work in two hours a day. It's not how my brain works. And so I remember feeling really anxious about like, how am I gonna do this? Cause that, it doesn't fit for me. Um, and what I ended up doing was carving out a full day, oh, you know, one day a week, um, you know, whether it was weekend or um, whatever, and then just writing all day. But a lot of that, like, quote unquote writing process was really thinking, right? It would be like, okay, I have to think through this thing. I'm gonna take a walk and just like grapple with it, right? Or I would be like thinking about it in the shower or thinking about it as I was trying to go to sleep. It was like all, it was my constant companion, the research process. And I think to the extent that you can kind of let it in and, and allow it to be that, um, so many insights came, you know, 
when I wasn't sitting in front of the computer trying to produce word count. <laughs> um, and so, so how is like thinking part of the process and how does thinking happen not in front of the computer? And um, yeah, and then figuring out like, what's the writing schedule that works for you? And for some people, maybe it is two hours a day. And for me, it was like, I had to take the whole day because I was so deep into it. I get so deep into it, I couldn't get out of it. Um, you know, and that was how I got the work done. That is such a relief to hear. I feel like that is my biggest hurdle right now is that I'm like, I've got to write every day for 30 minutes because everyone gives you that book of write your dissertation in 15 minutes a day, but it takes me a minute to wrap up and warm up to this thing. And then I was like, oh, I'm in it. And then I got to go. So I appreciate you saying that of like, find the writing schedule that works for you. And thinking does count um, of getting in that research process. So thank you so much for that wonderful tip. Um, I'm midway through, so I appreciate it so much. Um, as we're wrapping up this first 60 minutes of our conversation, I just want to do a few reminders before we dive into another 30 minutes of a deeper conversation with um, Dr. Starr. Um, a few reminders, we are recording this webinar and Elena, her team with Lead California will send out that link to folks in a few weeks, or a few days. Um, we are asking everyone to complete the webinar evaluation link that's in the chat, if possible. Um, our next dissertation dish is still pending, but we have a, an excellent speaker for you. It is gonna be Dr. Marisol Morales. She is the executive director of the Carnegie Elective Classifications. Her research focuses on same, engaging sameness, a phenomenological study on the community engagement experiences of Latinx students at a Hispanic serving institution. Um, when we have that date kind of finalized, we'll be sure to send that out to everyone. And then lastly, just thank you so much for spending time with us and learning so much more about Star's work and her research. And she's given us a lot of good gems and tips. So I do hope that many of you will stick around for the next 30 minutes um, for a more, a more engaging conversation. Um, did I miss anything, Trina or Elaine? No, I think I think we did have a, a question from Michael that oh, I think sorry. might be a good transition into our more open, unmute yourselves conversation, perhaps as well. So, um, but thank you, Rochelle, for wrapping us up, and thank you, everyone. I know there's some folks hopping off because you have other things to go to, but thank you, everyone, for attending so far. <laughs>